thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, before I start the actual talk, I have uh, three distractions uh, uh, to make. And some of you might understand them better. Uh, so for those of you that enjoy the uh, wonderful environment of image processing in Paris, uh, a lot of it started 20 years ago or something like that, right here. And uh, uh, with a fantastic uh, quarter like this one of mathematical imaging, uh, where uh, the old generation, even older than me, was here, David Mumford, uh, 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 I mean, Stefan and I were the young people around and, and many others. And uh, one of the persons that was a leader was Vicente. And uh, he passed away a couple of years ago. So we wrote the first in painting equations up here. And it's very, has been very emotional for me being here. So he will be a leader today on machine learning if he were alive. And contrary to us, he would be doing it right. So uh, the second part is a. Uh, uh, two more distractions just to smooth the previous more emotional part. Uh, one of the best talks, TED Talks on the web, is by a mathematician, uh, a great topologist, that was asked to talk about the future. And he spent the entire talk explaining why he's the wrong person. And then the entire talk was about what he's not going to talk. And then the talk was over. Uh, it's one of the best TED Talks i ever seen. Uh, and uh, by the way, the bottom line is that uh, he was asked to talk about the future. And he say, if you want to know the future, you ask five years old. You don't ask 50 years old people, uh, which he's absolutely right. So because I'm here for the week, I just wanted to tell you about two topics. And again, I'm using this as a smooth transition to the main topic that I'm not going to talk, but I will be happy to talk with you. So if you get for the first time, the image on the top left, uh, and you have no annotation, nothing else but object recognition, how do you understand that it's a very strange image? A cow should not be there. Uh, no annotations, no cocoa, no captions, no nothing like that. And it turns out that you can do it. Uh, and I will be happy to show you. And then you automatically detect that there are strange things on images. All what you need is, uh, is ImageNet and a bit of uh, internet. Uh, and then you can remove uh, skateboards, you can remove... The, the image on the right is very interesting because it, it it's, doesn't understand how students work, so it, cr it believes that a laptop uh, with dinner should not be together. And, and I think uh, it has not been in dorms uh, of PhD students for a while, the computer. Uh, but. Uh, the other part that I'm not going to talk, and this relates to the, but I would be happy, is relates in part to, to, the, to the previous talk about a, a lack of data for training. It turns out that you can actually use a, a, a computer-generated basic games data a, a, to train a computer vision if you do it smart. And in this case, we use games, basically completely artificial data, not GAMS, that try to be natural, just completely artificial data to train to detect uh, and segment uh, uh, urban scenes. And it works basically perfect with a system that has never seen real urban scenes uh, or almost none. And I would be happy to talk. It also relates to diction learning uh, topics. So those two topics are just, as I say, as smooth from the most emotional part. And then I'm going to go back to the topic of this, of this talk. And I gave, a, for some of you in the audience, I gave a, a, a seminar that uh, Gabriel hosted me just around the corner uh, uh, last summer. I, I spent almost every summer uh, uh, a, a few weeks in Paris. And at that time, I gave this talk. You're going to see a couple of slides that are similar, but the talk was about what I want to do. Uh, uh, as I say then, machine learning is moving so fast that the only thing the only way to talk about something that is not obsolete by the moment you talk is to talk about something you haven't done yet. <laughs> because whatever the previous talk, by the way, there's five papers during that talk on exactly that topic uploaded to archives uh, during that talk. 
Okay, so just go and search. It's just, it's just too fast. So I gave that talk and I said, I'm going to talk about what I want to do. And uh, now I'm going to talk about what we are doing right now. We are a bit more advanced, and in particular, we're, we're putting a bit more of theory. Uh, and after all, this is a math institute, uh, or, uh, so I wanted just to mention a bit of that. Uh, so the idea is how can we learn and teach and do things that kind of preserve privacy or obf obfuscate some information. So privacy is a loaded word. But let me just tell you a, a, a bit of background because I think it's interesting. So this is the chief economist of, of Google. And, and his opinion, and, and I respect like any other opinion, uh, uh, he says, you know, there is so much value that Google is producing for us today that we are kind of willing to give up a lot about our privacy or to give everything up. And, and he kind of has some point in that. But that's the opinion of one of the leading companies in the, in the planet. There, there are five leading companies in the planet. Uh, if you know, Amazon, Microsoft. Microsoft is the only one stays five for over 20 years. Uh, Google, uh, Apple, and, and Facebook. So on the other hand, you can go to the extreme. And, and Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, say that privacy is a human right. That was his sentence. I personally agree with that. Uh, and uh, 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 it's so funny. This is not a joke. It would have been a joke yesterday, April's fall, but not today. That's the official paper from Apple about privacy. No authors. They're so private that they even told us who are the authors of that paper. So you go to the web and you look, look Apple privacy manuscript. It's a fantastic paper that describes some of the efforts, particularly in differential privacy that Apple is doing. No authors on that paper. I, I found that very private and secret. I, I really also made me go and believe and, and look who are the privacy people at Apple. But, but that's the authors of the paper, differential privacy team at Apple. OK? Uh, and, unless that's the last name of the person. Actually, we already know, according to our president, the uh, team is Team Apple. So, uh, uh, so maybe this is their last name. Then you go to the other extreme, and you go to the company that shall not be named, that will just give your data to everybody that just pays them. And every week, sorry, I, I think there are Facebook people here, every week they say we are not going to do that again, and then the week after they do it again. So nobody, everybody knows that if you just have enough money, they will just tell you everything about everybody. And that will be forever, regardless of what their CEO keeps saying. Uh, at, at some point, you get caught on your own you know, mistakes or something. But so, so there is very extreme views about privacy out there. Uh, I can tell you in the United States, the moment that teenagers decide to be private is the day that they apply to college and they start to be ashamed of everything they show. So they, say, they, they realize that they should be a bit more private. Uh, but let me just give you, is privacy utopia? And for those that are not aware, uh, the privacy became a kind of a hot topic in machine learning in part to the Net Netflix uh, 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 price. Uh, Netflix uh, released uh, ra basic ratings of movies, as we discussed before, and said, can you predict them? I give you a million bucks. If you do that, your algorithms work 100 million, but I just give you a million. And then they, they, everybody signed that it's going to be very private, and then a professor now we're connecting because our previous speaker, if I'm right, your undergrad is from Princeton. So a professor at Princeton uh, uh, basically showed that if you just take IMDb, which is a public data set, and you correlate, you discover everybody on the Netflix. Netflix has to cancel the second round of the prize because they're being sued by all these people that they violated their privacy. So there is a lot of data out there that can shake your privacy. There is also, this is a great paper by Absalom Caspi and Temi Moffitt that they actually show that if, I, if you give me your heart condition, I can tell you your credit score. Credit score in many countries is very important to get a loan to buy a house. And, and actually, your heart condition, so you go to a doctor, I check your doctor, how good is your heart, is actually a better predictor than what actually the credit score companies are doing. So they actually show that there is very uh, uh, strange correlations in databases. And, and here's the last example that motivates a lot 
the work that we are that I'm going to show in the next in the next few minutes is that sometimes from exactly the same data that you give me I want to infer something you cannot block it I need that data to infer something while at the same time you want me to protect from doing that and I'm going to illustrate that in an example in a few minutes okay so it's not that oh there is something actually there is really in that data and how can I try to uh, avoid uh, 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 doing that. So you're looking at these two. Oh, we're being recorded. I need to be careful what I say here. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, you know, we might be interested in what they're saying, but we're looking at them, and then at the same time, we just get their age, their emotions, their gender, a lot of things that might be irrelevant uh, to to the task. But I want to look at them because I do, I want to do their body. Uh, position. So it's kind of uh, a, a chicken and egg problem here. So what we're going to try to do is the following, and we're going to be putting uh, information theory concepts here, and this is another discussion that I would be happy to have uh, about the need for more, my personal view is the need for more tools from information theory, machine learning, uh, and, 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 uh, but that's kind of for the lunch or the coffee uh, break. The idea is that we are going to start from a data. We are going to start from data. And the user, not the system, the user is going to define either to send you the data or to filter the data. Now, we have a utility estimator. And we have a privacy. So here, and we are going to define a, this sanitation function or the one that is going to obfuscate your data. And, but we are going to very often not allow you to touch these two guys. So they both have to be able to work on the real data or on the filter data. In the case of the utility, the performance has to be identical on both. Okay? So for example, let's assume that you want to identify this person. You want to match this person to a database. So you have to do the same performance on both. And the privacy, let's say gender. So you match the person, but you don't want to know if the person you're matching is male or female. If you give me the right data, it will say female. If you give me this, it will say I'm confused. But the same system has to be able. So this is actually, it's a map from the space to the same space. Because otherwise, we are going to have to modify this. And once in a while, we're going to do it. I'm going to show you examples with and without. But the basic idea is that, for example, I can actually have, and I'm going to show you examples, I can show, I can have my face recognition on my iPhone and mislead it without actually having to change it. And that actually has some implications because companies might be more willing to participate if you don't ask to completely redo their algorithms. Okay? So that's the goal, and we're going to learn this. This is the main goal, is that map. OK? So let's just start from basic intuition. But this is the basic idea. And oh, something very important here is that sometimes we want a, a utility, which is actually much harder than the private data. So this is a one, basically it's a matching function. We are a bit over 7 billion people in the planet. This is a binary function. If it were the other way around, PCA, problem solved, OK? So you just do a bit of PCA on your image, and identity is gone, but gender is not, OK? So, so there is nothing fantastic on the other direction. So let's just start by, by intuition. In, so remember, Q, this moves. I'm not too sure why. Somebody is having a sh shaking in the room. but. Uh, so Q is my filter image. The basic idea is the utility, the distribution of the utility given the filter image should be as close as possible to the distribution of the utility given the original data. So basically, the filter should not affect what's going on. On the other hand, for the privacy, you the, if you try to infer S from the filter data, you should be as close as possible to your prior distribution. That's basically the idea. The filter should not affect the distribution of the utility 
and you should push the distribution of the private, of the information you want to block, to uh, uh, the prior. So basically, I have, doesn't give you any knowledge, having the data or not. And that's basically, it's almost, I could almost stop the talk here, uh, because that's kind of the important concept. And then we are going to show one way of putting that concept into practice and show you a few examples. Uh, and please, I, I'm happy if you interrupt me any moment. We don't have to wait to the end. So, so any step you want to interrupt me, please just, just do so. Uh, we are going to measure this just using uh, mutual information and uh, basic KL divergence. Uh, so, so let me just tell you a couple of things. What I'm going to illustrate, and I'm going to explicitly put the formulas in the next one, is very, very closely related to the concept of information bottleneck, for those who are, are more familiar with, with uh, 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 basic information theory, and the information bottleneck has a lot of relevance for deep learning and machine learning. Most often in the, in the uh, information bottleneck, there is a Markov chain uh, kind of uh, assumption between X, U, and S, and we are not making that assumption. We're going to be completely data driven. And we're not going to make any assumption between U and S. So where if U and S are very correlated, I'm going to be very unlucky and my performance is not going to be very good. But I'm not going to assume that. And we're going to see that both on the theoretical bounds and on the, on the experiments. I'm not going to make an assumption that U and S are independent. And I'm trying to find the filter that separates them, which is an important problem, but I'm not making that assumption. And the other thing is that we're going to be working on, a, on expectation. And those in the room that are from the background of differential privacy, when I say that, you probably walk out of the room and you get very offended by, by that. Because differential privacy is based a lot on worst case scenario. Not all of it, uh, because there is the rainy differential privacy, there are extensions. But in differential privacy, the standard way, for those that are not familiar with differential privacy, the standard way and I'm not saying that's the only thing. Differential privacy is a beautiful mathematical theory, and it's used by almost any, every company today, so it's very influential. The basic idea is I'm going to give you the average of the age in this room, and I'm differential private. And from that, the way I give you the average, I have no idea to know if I was in the room or not. So the room with me and the room without me should be the same information, and then you have no way to infer if I was in the room. Okay? That's the kind of main uh, uh, goal of differential privacy. Once again, I, I don't want to limit that. It's actually broader, and I'm going to come to that. So now let's just talk about worst case scenario. And the differential privacy is what's called epsilon data, how robust you are to that. Let's say that we're talking about the average salary in this room. Looks a pretty easy task that you give the average salary, you remove every single one, the salary doesn't change a lot, so you probably cannot infer. You cannot do a lot, you can't infer who is in the room. But by chance, you guys didn't know, but Bill Gates is in the room. So if he's in or out, the average has changed a lot. So on average, I wouldn't care about Bill Gates. Differential privacy will go through tremendous effort to put noise on the average salary so you can never recognize that Bill Gates was in the room to the level that the information will be irrelevant. The amount of noise that they will have to add because Bill Gates was in the room will make basically the measurement irrelevant. Okay? In the standard way of differential privacy. For us, screw Bill Gates. Everybody else will be protected, Bill Gates won't, you know, you made a lot of money, it's your problem. Okay? So that's a fundamental difference. We are weaker than differential privacy that is trying to protect everybody. Okay? By the way, there is extensions of differential privacy where the noise depends on who you want to protect and how much. So if you want to protect Bill Gates, you add a lot if you don't care. So I'm just giving you that we are going to be on average. Okay? So once in a while, your identity will be relieved, and that's a price to pay. So, how are we going to do it? Basically, there is a compromise that is drawn here, but let me just explain you the equations, and then uh, uh, just give you a 
bit more of details. So the first part is that we want to minimize the mutual information between u and x given q. Okay, why to minimize? This is the information loss or the information leakage. The reason is, if I give you q, if, I, if q preserves about u everything as I want it, then once I give you q, there is nothing left to tell you about u. So this should be as small as possible, and this this blue portion. So once again, I just told you Q, I told you the filter image, and if Q has all the information you wanted about you, there is nothing left to tell you. And that's why we want to minimize that. We want to minimize the mutual information between U and X given Q, given the filter image. And we are doing that subject that the information between S and Q is bounded. I'm going to work on average. Okay, uh, this relates to differential privacy. They will put epsilon, but they will try to put supremum. And there is a neighborhood set and a very important mathematically beautiful concept, which I'm not using yet. Uh, next summer when I come again, I'm going to show you that part. But you're going to bound the mutual information. Now, just a simple uh, uh, information theory will tell you that this is actually exactly what I showed before. This is the KL divergence between the distribution of U given X and the distribution of U given Q. That's exactly this here, such that, that the divergence between S given the filter image and the original is bounded. That's exactly the intuition. Okay, so mutual information, I'm measuring it and it's mathematically equivalent under just mild conditions to the KL derivation. So the distance between distributions, and you can use other distance if you prefer to. So for example, you can just use Rainy entropy and other things here. Okay? So that's what we want to optimize for. And since we are in, in 2019 or wherever we are, uh, we are going to have to do it uh, with uh, uh, deep learning and stuff like that. But this is the equation. We are going to minimize this, and we are trying to make the mutual information as close as possible to K, both measure with the KL divergence. And if you start taking gradient, this, this is going to be completely data driven. You're going to give you images. I'm going to have identity on them. I'm going to have the gender. I'm going to just train a filter. I'm going to just give one slide for, for hackers. How do we do that? And you do gradient descent on everything. You need to start, it's data, so I need to start learning distributions. I need to learn the distribution of S given Q, the distribution of U given Q, the distribution of U given X. So those are basically these equations here. There are three equations that are learning distributions so I can minimize this. And then there's the fourth equation that basically is the one that minimizes. So in order for me to compute these things, I need to estimate all these guys and I'm estimating them from data. If they were given, I don't have to, but I'm estimating them from data. So again, three equations to estimate distributions and then this equation to do that. So that's what we need to do from data. So for those that are uh, uh, really hackers of, of machine learning and, and deep learning, the distributions are learned with an exception type of, uh, so these are famous networks. The distributions use a modification of the exception uh, uh, type of network. The filter is a unit type of architecture. Okay? So those are the two things, basically, to learn this. Okay? So once again, you're matching distributions. They're competing. Uh, I actually didn't stress too much. But if you look at this diagram, so I'm basically trying to they optimize between the blue and the red, and they might not really be able to optimize. So we do data-driven. We have a, a couple of a, 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 a bounds. They're not as good, and, and in the paper we actually show how they actually are pretty good, but I wish they were a bit tight. Uh, we have a lower bound. We actually have two theorems in the paper about lower bounds. But let me just stress this guy here. I mentioned to you, so how well you can do 
let's say on, on this, I wanted to make it as small as possible. Sorry, if the utility and the privacy are very, very correlated, you're not going to be able to do a good job. That's life, okay? So basically, if your right eye is equal to your left eye, if you show me your left eye, I can probably guess the color of your right eye. And there's nothing you can do to stop me from doing that. And that shows in the bound, we didn't force it, it just appeared. Okay, and, and we were happy to see it because this is the kind of things that in standard privacy, you don't really see that. And that shows up in the epsilon and in the delta in differential privacy. And then we also have an upper bound. So basically you can show that you can achieve with the constraint you can achieve this type of uh, 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 mutual information so, uh, uh, that we say should be as small as possible. And once again, it appears the mutual information between the privacy and the data and the utility and the data. So it's important to understand in privacy what you can do. And, and again, uh, uh, there is beautiful theory in differential privacy. We're trying to bring some to this mutual information type of things. And there is no free lunch, so, if you, so you will need to pay the price for these kind of things. Okay? Any questions before I show you amazing examples? Okay. So let's just do a couple of examples. This is relatively easy, but it's very illustrative of what's happening. So here is the call. We want to obfuscate emotion, preserve gender. I want to know if you're female or male, but I don't want to know if you are smiling or sad, for example. Okay? And, oh, remember the tolerance K? If I just say K infinity, there is no privacy. And when I start making K lower, the K is actually bits, because we're talking about mutual information. It's kind of bit rate. So let's just concentrate first on two columns. Here, we actually pick a system that was doing okay. It wasn't the best out there, but it's close to state of the art. Uh, I'm going to explain you the images in a second. And it was doing about 80% on emotion and about 92% on, uh, on basically gender recognition. And we start increasing, decreasing this. And when you get there, you just get almost to a flip of a coin. And you actually increase your gender. That's not an unsurprised. I can give that. Is there homework for people here? This is not expected, but it's not surprise. So those that do statistics, uh, nuisance variables, basically you were actually misled on gender by emotions. And the moment I block emotions, you actually start doing better on gender. Bias data sets. Okay? So for those of you, uh, uh, basically, that uh, use dating sites, I don't. I'm, I'm happily married. But I was told, and I believe the person that told me, that uh, one of the cupid or whatever says to females, smile in your profile picture to males, be serious. Okay? That that makes more attractive one or the other. And I'm not surprised about that. So the moment I, I'm not surprised that they say that. I'm surprised that people think that way. But again, we're in 2019 and almost every country with your president, nothing should surprise you anymore. Uh, but uh, so sorry, Rick, erase that part. Uh, but uh, 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 so, so maybe, maybe by blocking some of the biases, on the data set, I actually can do better training. And that's something that the community is also looking at that. And this is what, so the performance is what we expected. And this is what's happening. We, so this is the original. This is K, I think, uh, 0, 04. And this is K02. And it's basically the filter learn to block the area of your mouse. For those of you that are involved in emotion analysis, it's called, it's called the activation units. And if you look at the literature on, on emotion, smiling is basically by, mostly detected by the region of the mouth. There is other parts, but this is the most informative for emotion. So the system learned 
to do that. We didn't train it to do that. It just learned, if you want me to block emotion, but looks like the top half was what most of the information was there to recognize gender, even with a hat. Okay? Let's just pick, this is one of my favorite examples. Uh, oh, I forgot this. This was when we fix the emotion analysis. Here is trained on an adversarial, mislead any emotion analysis out there, which is actually a bit more powerful. And the performance is a bit worse. I want 50%, but not too, too worse. Okay, so I basically can train on an adversarial fashion. This is actually my favorite example, and I need to put my hands out. So for those of you that have iPhone 10 or Samsung One or whatever, that you can open with your, uh, uh, with your face. If you grab my phone now, it actually captured your face and it decided not to open, but it captured your face. So it basically violated your privacy, okay? And if you're walking behind me, it just captured me and you. So it again violated your privacy. Actually, it has a distance sensor, so it has to be relatively close. So we did the following. We say, instead of going into two different disciplines, let's just divide the data set in two. These two guys are owners of the phone and the filter should not affect them. These two guys are not. So everybody else is not. The filter should destroy their face. At the filter level, you basically should not after the photons, it should be gone. So never save in your device. It's kind of silly that I'm capturing everybody just to detect one person. I'm gonna give you the parallel application. So those of you that have devices, so my device is listening right now, 100% of the time, just waiting for, hey Siri. I have to say it quietly. And your devices at home are, wait, are listening all the time just to hear Alexa or something like that. It's kind of silly that they are hearing everything just for one word. And this is blocking them from doing that. Okay? So, the consenting users, when we reduce this, so at first, everybody was on 98%. This is a very, this is a VGG uh, standard uh, uh, people identification, outstanding performance. And we start filtering, we preserve really good performance on a frame-by-frame -frame basis, but the people that we decided, if we say particular people, please do not capture them, only do performance on 3%, and this is actually a random, random will get you about 3%, and if we say everybody in the database, I'm not telling you who, whoever is not these two guys should be blocked, uh, gets about 5%. And this is actually the output that the filter did. It's kind of amazing that the filter basically did almost nothing to the guys, almost nothing, let them through, and destroy the others. Same filter. It's almost, it's not almost, the filter did face recognition on the fly. Not really face, it says authorized, non-authorized, but on the fly. So now, if this is the information that is on the phone, by the way, I just want to clarify, when you're trying to open my phone, the information does not go on the internet, I is erased, so it's pretty private, but there is vulnerability because it had to be brought to the phone and then hackers can go into, but they're never shared, so you are safe from that perspective. But basically, this is what a hacker gets if they hack your sensor, okay, of everybody that is not the phone owner. We just give you one more example. In the next example, it's actually one of the difficult examples. I want actually to remove gender and preserve identity, what I was giving before. Those are very highly correlated things. And then uh, here actually you have five examples and to the right you start decreasing K, so you want to be stronger and stronger on your privacy and you destroy more and more of your face. And you see that basically when I start increasing K, basically decreasing K, so I want to start increasing your privacy, 
So yes, your gender becomes really, really, is starting to go in the right direction, but you start basically hurting also your identity recognition because these two variables are very, very correlated. Unless, so this is again VGG, unless you say, hey, you know what VGG guy? I'll let you train the last layer. Okay, I'm not gonna treat you as a black box. You're the owner of your own code. I'm gonna let you retrain just the last layer, a bit more. And then uh, you start basically uh, catching up again, just with the last layer. And the reason I'm showing this is because sometimes there is a compromise between how much you can protect something to preserve the other. So here, if I let you, if I don't let you, so here is 50%, that's pretty good. If I don't let you change your identity identification code at all because of the high mutual information between S and U, you have a drop in performance. By the way, this is, if you work with video, this is insignificant uh, because mistakes are random. So if I get three frames, I get it right. But per frame, you drop by 20 something percent. If I allow you to do a bit of retraining in your system, then you get back performance. Okay, so your system kind of understood uh, C3 here, your, your system kind of understood that this deformed phase should be the same as this phase, but only the last layer, so you don't need a lot of retraining there. Uh, let me just for the sake of time, let me just keep this. There is interesting connections, but I just wanna, as I say, this uh, when I, I, I will be happy to discuss with you later. But let me just tell you, as, as I say, uh, 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 we, we're more advanced than we were a year ago. We're significantly more advanced. Uh, we have some theory, we have real applications, we have robust codes. Uh, we, we are working more on theoretical foundations now. Uh, we are, uh, Kind of interesting in, in putting constraints on what, how far, how hard are you willing to work? Uh, and, and this came for, uh, you know that the president of the country I live and the president of the country most of you live, when they fly to a place, their flight plan becomes public because it's FAA. So I asked myself, kind of interesting, basically you know where the plane with the president is. So you violated privacy and it's a very dangerous. But he's flying 50,000 feet. So the only people that really can hurt is two countries. So the level of privacy is extremely high. The amount of power that you need to do something with the violation of privacy, you need to be China or Russia, basically, to do that. So this issue of privacy has a concept of how much I'm willing to pay. It's just my phone on real time or is the entire Chinese army that I'm applying to violate your privacy. So if we start putting that, which we haven't done yet, then your things start looking much better because it, it, I might be able to filter in a fashion that you need a lot of effort to decode me. And that, I haven't talked about that, but that would be pretty important. And that's why they don't care about the plan, because most cases, Russia and China don't want to take down the President of the United States. If it was to fly lower, they wouldn't disclose the flight plan, because everybody can take them down, and there's plenty of people that will willing. So in, in, energy is very important. We are now working, and hopefully we'll be ready in a couple of weeks, the, the formal connections with differential privacy, and as I alluded before, there is other connections with machine learning. I, I briefly went over them, but we are very interested if this filtering should not help uh, training systems better. And there are people that are working on that and reducing biases on stuff like that. Uh, I mentioned the application to audio, and we do have this already on hardware. Not at the sensor level, but almost. So if you come to one of the conferences that, that we hope to present, we might be demoing, basically, because we have this on hardware. From the camera, what comes out is basically filter. And I think I'm gonna stop here and just give a couple of minutes for questions.
So, any question? Uh, regarding the phone application, uh, you were mentioning about uh, the software being able to see other people than the actual owner. I don't understand exactly how your solution is solving this problem because the... I put it at the sensor. Okay, you, so you do it at the hardware level. Yeah. But then you need to change the hardware for every phone of every person. So you reconfigure it f f with software and like you change the uh, hardware configuration. Yeah, so, so the, it's a great question. A great question. When you get today an iPhone, you have to train it for your face. Yeah. That's the first thing you do. When you do that, you're training the filter and the filter goes on firmware to the okay. software, to the, to the sensor. Okay. It wouldn't be hard. Okay. I mean, you need the companies to buy into that, yeah. but it wouldn't be hard. The, the only thing, fortunately, they're not connecting to the internet. If they were connecting to the internet, then you do it and you say, I'm not allowing you to send. By the way, audio is. Mm -hmm. Alexa works with the internet and Siri works with the internet. So they are not for detecting the initial, but after that. So depending on where you want to cut. But yeah, you do it on firmware. But yeah. my understanding is that your solution is using like a big neural network. Uh, it's a small. So it's a small one? Yeah. Okay. yeah. And once you train, it's, it's, it's really, it also depends. If you're the only user, uh, I can, it's a very small. If you have 100 users that I need to authorize, then if I need to authorize one user, the iPhone, the new version, I think authorized two. Uh, the, the old, uh, it's one, I think now it's two. So it's, it's a very small network. Okay. Yeah. It's on the structure of new unit, but it's very small. It's a sp tiny unit. Any other question? Uh, I would like to, to know if I have uh, understood well uh, the problems that you are going, you are addressing. Uh, you have a set of the data, and uh, you want to first in the first step you want to know what are the features which can be distinguished, which can be. And then you want to preserve some of the features while uh, stopping the others or altering the others. So you want to alter the data to keep these features. This is, this is Yeah, I want to, not properties of mm -hmm. the data, I will say. Uh, gender is not kind of a, maybe it's more a language. Uh -huh. But yeah, that's, but, I'm, but, but, but your point is correct. I want, I'm the user, it's in my control. Yes. And, and then uh, when I'm uploading my image to Facebook, it should be a black image uh, for, uh, on my slides before. When I upload to Apple, I might allow you to do more. I'm in charge of that filter, okay? And, and, and basically the, the, the ownerships and the privacy goes to me. So let me just give you another, another very important, and some companies are actually very supportive of this. When I go to the airport, and they need to match me to my passport. They don't need to match my emotion, my gender, my nothing. They just need to match me to the passport. So this is the kind of application that is very important. This is also a very important application of medical uh, research. When I volunteer as being part of medical research, I volunteer to give you A, B, C, and not to give you D. And I opt in. So how can I filter my medical data that D you cannot do? Uh, and that's what we're trying to do here. This was, by the way, inspired by one of our medical applications. Yeah. Thanks. Great question. Thank you. Another question in the room? Gabriel wants to know what are we having for lunch. I'm just reminding you that... Uh, <laughs> So about the numerical procedure you used for doing the minimization of this callback uh, loss, do you use like something like GANs or I mean there's a way to... These two... <coughs> it looks... If we train adversarial, we use kind of GAN, but, the, but let me just... The filter is trained by a unit type of framework and then we do probability estimations uh, and, and divergence com uh, with, with this other network. So it's networks that are doing both. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, but I have to tell you, it took us a while to make those networks stable because we are estimating probability distributions, KL divergence, and now they are. Now they are. But it took us a while. It wasn't a trivial problem to make this, these networks. Uh, it's like multiple GANs, if you think, and everybody that works with GAN knows that it's hard to make them work. So 
it's kind of the same type of networks and they're multiple. But now it's stable. Now, now we're going to release the code. Now we're confident that that is a stable code. Yeah, we shake it and it comes back. Uh, before, when I gave my lecture a year ago, we shake it and it never came back. Uh, but now it's coming back. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so let's thank our speaker again.